Hello there, and welcome to Speaking of Our Words, radio programming that brings you the wide range of voices, stories, and forms of local writers, and offering you some insight into their creative process. My name is Chris DeGuire. I teach creative writing workshops at Columbia College Chicago, and I am your host. The Kenosha Writers Guild, and more importantly, the world, lost a vibrant and important voice. Marguerite McClelland passed away recently. We featured Marguerite on the show several times, and today we will honor her and her work. Jim Payne, a regular contributor on the show, will say a few things about Marguerite and her work, and then several members of the Kenosha Writers Guild will read pieces of her work, her stories and poetry. After which we will hear a few pieces from some of the readers of their own work. But first, to tell us a little bit more about Marguerite McClelland and her work, here's Jim Payne. The words that, that speak best for Marguerite McClelland are her own. Here are a few words of Marguerite's in her introduction to her book, Stories from the War. These are her words. The stories that follow are about my people, people like you, caught up in events beyond their control. I hope that my sharing them with you will bring you a little closer to these events. I hope, too, that in your lifetime, War will become a thing of the past. If peace is to be, it must be in the minds and hearts of each one of us, here, now, in this city, in this school, in this classroom, in this time. Peace comes not in treaties between nations, however much honored. It comes when we cease to be strangers to one another, when each of us individually can genuinely reach across the barriers of nationality, race, class, gender, and religion. It comes not on the wings of a dove, but in the music of the heart. Besides her advocacy for peace, there were many things we remember about Marguerite. We saw her arms wave in a sweeping arcs as she commented on her poems. We heard the delightful, trilling lilt of her French accent. In her eyes, we sensed her feelings were deeper than the words on her lips. After I read my story about losing my loving wife, Marguerite came to me and said, You look like you need a hug, and wrapped her arms around me, holding me in her embrace. That was Marguerite, sensitive to someone else. We'll always remember this special woman. Marguerite McClellan saw World War II through the stories told by her mother, by her relatives, by her friends, by strangers. Marguerite knew her father through stories, knew loss and recovery and hope through stories. Many of these are about the sadness of a people caught in the conflict of war, but always there was in Marguerite's telling them a longing for peace. All through her teaching and writing career, she used poems and stories to share her life with others. So we, of her Kenosha Writers Guild, are reading her writings to you, that you may remember this special lady through her words. These are Marguerite's stories and poems I think she is listening to them along with you. Jim Payne, thank you very much. Our, our, our first reader of Marguerite's work is going to be Irene Baylock. Hello, Irene. Hello. Irene, what, what are you going to read from, from Marguerite McClelland? I'm going to read from her book, Stories from the War. And I remember Marguerite very fondly. I didn't see her or read her stories or hear her read her stories very often because somehow we missed each other at many meetings. Either she would not come or I would not come. But at the times that we did come, we did feel an empathy with each other because both of us were children of World War II. As we read certain pieces of our writing, we knew that our experiences were very significant and uh, all of them colored our life. I'm reading a piece called Missing in Action. 
Chapter 3 My mother told me many stories over the years. Once she was alone in the cellar with me during a bombing raid. When it was quiet again, she heard a knocking, persisting for hours, on the cellar door which she dared not open. Was it a neighbor looking for shelter? Was it a lost soldier desperate for food? An enemy? A friend? She dared not find out, so she spent the night with a terrible dilemma between helping our neighbor in need and the possibility of getting killed. When soldiers began to come home, a few at a time, gaunt, sick, and wounded but alive, my mother's hope rose only to come crashing down again and again. Yes, they were in the same company. No, they hadn't seen him in a long time. At one point, there was a rumor that he had lost his will to live and was so depressed that he actually walked into the path of a tank, but nobody knew for sure. Once, on hearing that several men from a neighboring village who had been fighting in the same unit as my father had come home, she hoped on a bus, her heart brimming with hope and anticipation. But no one knew anything more than what she had already heard before. The trip home, she says, was the saddest hour of her life. My father was never found. After seven years, he was declared dead so my mother could get on with her life. Others waited many more years, hoping against hope that their husband was in a Russian POW camp and would eventually be released. One woman had just such an experience. One night in 1975, there was a knock on the door during that family's Christmas Eve celebration. The ban was the husband, back from the war, 30 years older and several times a grandfather. That could have been a nightmare had the woman remarried, but it was instead a wonderful Christmas present. She had waited all these years in the belief that her husband was alive. Here is a poem from the point of view of a child only dimly aware of her mother's preoccupation. There are many things that children miss during war. Food, comfort, safety, but especially fun. Hmm. Irene Baylock, thank you very much. Uh, Lisa Adamowitz Kless is next. And Lisa, I believe you are going to be reading this poem. I am. Um, I think, you know, you said it well in the beginning that Marguerite was just vibrant as a perfect adjective, I think, to describe her just such such a bright light and, and such a bright, you know, vibrant personality. And, um, you know, speaking about her, her book stories from the war, um, my grandpa was a young soldier during World War II, and he didn't really ever talk too much about his experiences. But, um, you know, hearing from Marguerite and, and hearing her work and reading her work just kind of gave me, I think, a richer perspective of that time and sort of uh, maybe gave me a little bit of insight, maybe not, you know, exactly into his personal experience, um, but just seeing another facet of the experience of being, you know, being alive and experiencing that time. So this is her poem, Missing in Action, that went along with what Irene just read. There's a puppet show in town, and Mama is sitting by the window, by the light of falling day, knitting a sweater for a man. To save the lights, she always says, but she sits in the same place, in the middle of the morning, when the sunlight fills the room. There was a juggler here, last week when I was five, and a magician, and the man with the snakes, and she said, maybe tomorrow, and then she said, yes, we'll go. Now she sits by the window. She isn't listening to me. I know what she is listening for. She's listening for the footsteps of the soldiers coming home. And now she puts the knitting down and looks with growing eyes, like she's never seen it before, at the hole in the house across the street that's been there a million hundred years. And she says, no. Well, Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, next up is going to be Dave Gordo. Hello, Dave. Hey, Chris. Dave, what selection are you going to read? I'm going to read a, a poem and some, some background information about her relationship with her father. Okay, uh, Marguerite was born in, I think it was August of 1943, in the Alsace region, which sits right on the border between Germany and France. So she was born in, 
at the chronological and geographical epicenter of, of World War II, a very tumultuous time. And her father was a casualty of the war, and she never knew. And about, uh, about him, she, this is what she wrote in her book. Our men then either died or became POWs in Russia if they didn't come back, and many of them didn't. That I grew up without a father was nothing unusual. Many of my classmates were in the same situation. When people sometimes asked if I missed him, I could only reply, no. How do you miss someone you never knew? My situation, to me, was normal. My father was an abstraction. And then she goes on to explain how 45 years later, in 1988, the man who was both her uncle and godfather passed away. And as they were going through his things, they found a, a bunch of letters between her father and her uncle, a correspondence, and it was very moving to Marguerite to, to come across these uh, letters that were written in her father's hand and to touch the same paper and ink that her father had touched. And one letter in particular was, was, was very moving. It was dated August 15th, 1943, and, and again, this is from her father to her uncle. Dear brother-in-law, I finally have some news from home. My brother wrote me that we have a little girl. The baby is a week old already. I don't know when I'll get home. Until I get a telegram, I can't, put in a, I can't put in a request for leave. I hope I'll get something today or tomorrow. So, so at, at this point, reading that, um, Marguerite's father is no longer an abstraction. He became real and tangible. And, and the fact that she knew he, he knew about her, he knew she existed, and they tried to get home to see her, but he didn't make it. It was very powerful. It took about a year to absorb everything. Then she wrote this poem. This poem is called A Resurrection. Father, you stepped out of the heaps of broken stones that lined the streets of my childhood. Forty-five years of my mother's waiting and giving up and moving on and still remembering sometimes. Forty-five years of stories from the ones who came back and from your brothers and from your sisters themselves now passing on. Forty-five years of settled dust and settled war accounts and settled lives. These years have held your formless face amidst the ruins of a madman's dream. And now a letter awakens you, summons you from these deep labyrinths of time, decrees your existence for me. I hear the rifle crack at your elbow and the boom of the cannon from another hill and the clanking and grinding of tanks over the Russian steppes. I feel the pounding of the blood in your throat as you write amidst the, f the, amidst the flares, and on your lips I read the prayer, Dear God, I have a daughter. Let me make it home. All right, Dave, thank you very much. All right, and next up is going to be Walter Gascoigne. Hello, Walter. Hi, Chris. Walter, what selection are you going to read? Um, I'm going to read two of them, actually. Um, she told us about this man that she met quite by accident, and she says this in the book in Illinois in 96. It was a Mr. Sullivan who fought near her village during the bitter winter of 1944, just before the Battle of the Bulge. And then since then, every year until he died, they wrote long letters back and forth, but mostly he would just talk about the battle of this one night in particular that they had. So um, when he passed away uh, last year, she says at the age of 96, she wrote a tribute to him, and this is the poem. I was a baby, a child of World War II. You saved. We met by chance so many years later, so few years ago. You wrote to me every Christmas, always remembering that terrible night that you would not let go. Ben Denthal, near the Franco-German border, Christmas, 1944. Perhaps you thought as you wrote that by telling the story and telling it again and again, it might diminish and go away like an echo. But that terrible night in December, 1944, in the forest near my village, has etched itself into your mind and into my heart forever. And the second one I'd like to read is triage. I'd like to say something before that. Um, it's amazing how somebody can come from such a horrible situation and place and turn out to be so brilliant. It, it amazes me that that, that can happen. Um, this one's called triage. A soldier looked kind, doing his job. He sent a dozen citizens back home, smiling as they went, leaving me an ancient Jew, and then I knew but faith would not relent. 
That woman on the train, she's French, whispered the Jew. I watched her lips make motions without a sound. Ich bin Deutsch, not a drop of French in me. Ja, I see, I see. I thought of dinner waiting at home, hoping this wouldn't take too long. The Jew looked knowing, and the soldier looked kind, and thawing in my frozen mind the silent plea, O bit das nicht, o bit das nicht, nay. The soldier smiled, no rifle in sight, so mild, doing his job. That's how it started, whispered the Jew. Do something, run while you can. I wondered if there might not be a gun behind the soldier then, and in a moment weighed six years against eternity, and an hour was all I could see. And the soldier smiled, doing his job, and the woman on the train began to sob without a sound. That's how it started, whispered the Jew, and I hoped this wouldn't take too long. Dinner at home was getting cold. Yeah, Walter, thank you very much. Um, you know, not only did she have this 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 wonderful and unique voice, um, she was a really good listener too. And I remember, uh, I'm going to share a, a quick story here. I remember the first Writers Guild meeting she came to. It was one of our first meetings at Carthage College, and and you know we, we we've all done these you know reading of our work in front of you know our, our our friends and and strangers who come to the meetings for the first time, and um, and I've been doing it for a very long time, and. I always get nervous anyways when I'm reading, but on, on, on that particular night, I think there were a few other newbies in the in the classroom that night, and I just had this really whacked out story from this novel I'm working on about these two kids in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and there's all these pop cultural references, and I'm just thinking, oh, I don't want to read this piece tonight, but you know, I, I read it anyways, and what what ended up being so great about it is 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 her comments you know, even though most of the group there had heard excerpts from that from that novel in progress, um, that, you know, she, she did say that even though she did not understand all of the pop cultural references, that she was still able to understand the story of these two kids who were trying to figure themselves out. And th that, that comment's always meant the world to me because that just means that, you know, no matter what we're writing about, you know, we're, we, we get down to these things that make us people, you know, and these things that we worry about. I mean, everyone goes through all these things. It was just so nice to have her say those words. And, and, and that actually kept me wanting to write a little bit more in that story because I knew that even though she was not necessarily my, my target audience for that book, you know, there's always the wider audience for that. And I always found that to be very, very helpful. Um, so Jim Payne is going to read... Um, one more poem, so I will uh, turn it over to Jim. Uh, this is from Marguerite's childhood. In the woods near her home, where she spent much of her time, her childhood picking berries, mushrooms, and kindling wood, and dreaming about America. And she called it home. The town below lay cozily between the folds of the afternoon. The girl, alone, on the crest of the hill, watched the cloudless sky, hung motionless above the lofty pines. Smoke from village chimneys drifted into the evening chill, the ping from the blacksmith's shop, the screech of the saw at the mill, the bell of the grocer's door, and the bark of an angry dog after the peddler of ribbons and shoelaces. These Taking turns, hop skipped to where she lay, and the yellow bench a little ways below held patiently her half-filled bag of kindling for the winter fires when she burned with desire for far away. She didn't know how winding trails turn into arrowed roads unending never wending their way back home. How hollow the rumbling stone against the rubber of wheels, unbending. How like them she would grow, distant and dull and hollow, and follow and follow. And this is Marguerite. 
she's in her home now. All right, Jim. Jim, thank you very much. Uh, Margaret McClellan, thank you for sharing your life and your work with us. You are greatly missed. And thank you, all of you here, for sharing her stories and your stories. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words. Okay, now we're going to hear a few selections from, from our readers, some of, the, some of their own work they're going to read. Um, Irene Baylock is first up. So, Irene, what are, you, what are you going to read to us? I have a section from my novel, which is uh, sort of similar to what Marguerite ha uh, was writing. It's about a prisoner of war. It's a character in my book, Nadia. She is in prison, and a wonderful person has come to visit her, a nun. And so I'm going to start here. The ever-caring Sister Yarena appeared again several weeks after her first visit. She could tell that Nadia seemed a bit stronger. She had found a dress, socks, underwear, and a sweater for Nadia. Sister knew these items would make Nadia look and feel better. I have managed with a bit of persuasion to get you a shower. This will help you to feel better, look nicer, and stronger. After that, you can change into these clean clothes. Nadia's eyes grew large from the wonderment of it all, and she immediately did as Sister told her. While she was showering, Sister Yarena took the dirty blanket off the bed, placed it in her sack, and replaced it with a clean and warmer one she had brought. Mrs. Picoon, you look like a different woman in your clean dress and sweater. Here is a clean brush for your blonde hair. Brush away. Oh, the shower was wonderful. How can I repay you, sister? Nadia queried. Be kind to others who are worse off than you are, replied Sister Yarena, and pray. Pray long and hard. The good sister continued to visit, bringing with her pencils and paper so Nadia could occasionally write, especially when the guards were not too vigilant. Sister also brought Nadia scraps of fabric and embroidery thread so she could embroider during the long evenings. All this was done surreptitiously and kept hidden from other prisoners. This was not an easy task, as some of the prisoners were nosy. They were hungry, and for an extra bowl of porridge, for a piece of bread, a cigarette, they, snitch on in, they snitched on each other. Somehow Nadia was fortunate and did not get herself into trouble. When time was right, she wrote short poems on a small piece of paper, love letters to Michael, that was her husband, short prayers she remembered, and thank you notes to Sister Yarena and God. Sometimes Nadia wrote to Greg, Yuri, her brothers, and sometimes to Mama and Tato. One particular day on a very dismal afternoon, she wrote a note to her adoptive guardian parents thanking them for their care. All these bits of paper Nadia lovingly placed under her mattress, and when she felt happy or when she was sad, she took them out and read them over and over. These rereadings relaxed her, soothed her dark mood, although, of course, she also cried. Dearest Michael, darling husband, loving gentleman and friend, loved you then and love you now, miss you, long for you, till we meet again. Kisses and warm hugs. How I long to see your face, to feel your loving arms around me. Where are you, my dearest? I hope you're not beaten the way I have been. I sometimes feel that it was all my fault. Are you well? So many years have gone by. Yours forever, your loving Nadia. Greg, my brother, Yuri, too. Do you miss me? Love you both very, very much. Don't forget me. Do you still play soccer? Do you have girlfriends? I wish you could have met Michael, my husband. We could have had such good times together. Help Mama and Tato. Lovingly until we meet again, Nadika. Mama, Tato, you broke my heart when you left me. I forgive you now, but it was very hard. I wish we had all stayed together. Where are you? Why did you not come back for me as you had promised? I will always look for you. Maybe we can still be together someday. Your loving daughter, Nadika. Mom, Claudia, Tato, Anton, 
How I respect and love you. You took me in and raised me as your own daughter. You also loved and respected Michael. God bless and keep you. Hope to see you after I get out of this place. Truly, your obedient and grateful daughter, Nadia. Nadia read, sobbed, tired herself out, and then hid the notes under the mattress again until the next time. The embroidery threads she chose were red and black. Nadia had several pieces of small white strips of embroidery, embroidery fabric, which she started to sew. On one, she decided to embroider a cross. That way, she could look at it when she prayed. On another, she embroidered a small tree, which reminded her of outdoors, which she longed for and never got to see. It also reminded her of freedom for which she pined. If only that time would come. As Nadia poured over the stitches of her artistic pieces, which she lovingly worked, she wept and remembered Claudia and the neighbor Maria, who so diligently spent time with both of them, coaching them in the art of Ukrainian embroidery. How worthwhile the time had been spent after school, talking and learning this precious art. She saved the other pieces for another time. I'll do a bird, a church, or a beautiful geometric design with the other threads. I remember that the colors red are for love and the black is for grief. Little pieces of cloth made with love and devotion, hidden under the mattress to be admired when days are empty and gray. Someday, perhaps, I'll give them to Michael, Sister Yorena, or my mother. Mama, Claudia, Mama, dear God, would such a day come? Irene, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words, and next up is Dave Gordeaux. Dave, what are you going to read? Um, I've got a essay or a personal memoir that I wrote and posted to my web site about a year ago. So, here it goes. It's called Life, Death, and Jelly-Filled Bismarcks. Once again, for the record, I am old. How old am I? I'm old enough to remember a world without the internet without cell phones, without personal computers, without ATMs, without cable or satellite TV, without email, without Facebook, without microwave ovens. I'm old enough to remember full service gas stations, locally owned grocery stores, rotary phones, barber shops, and one income families. School was filled with mimeographed worksheets, film strips, and cardboard cartons of chocolate milk. I'm old enough to remember McDonald's before the Big Mac, when all you could get was a hamburger or a cheeseburger. I'm old enough to remember when we got our first color television. I'm old enough to remember watching the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. I grew up in a small town in southeastern Wisconsin, my family having moved there from northwestern Wisconsin when I was three and a half years old in 1962. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was a time when most households had one wage earn, earn, earner, and the moms, like my mom, typically stayed at home. What seems so amazing about it now, looking at the way things are today, is back then, blue-collar, middle-class working men earned enough to provide good lives for their families. There were, on the block surrounding the middle of Yorkville Avenue, where we lived, three men, including my dad, who drove trucks of one kind or another, and they lived side by side with a school superintendent, the owner of the town's grocery store, the town dentist and the town doctor, a pharmacist, an airplane mechanic, insurance salesman, and a bookkeeper. They all lived in modest but comfortable 1960s era ranch homes. My dad was an over-the-road driver, a teamster, driving 18-wheelers to various places in Ohio and Indiana, driving by night, home and sleeping in his own bed behind shaded windows that blacked out the daylight every other day, days that we'd only see him at the supper table. On weekends, he'd get an extra day, the one day of the week he was able to spend the entire time with us. How old am I? I'm old enough that when I was 11 years old, jelly-filled Bismarck's at the local bakery sold for eight cents a piece. Eight cents. I can't think of anything you can get for eight cents these days. I remember too that a bottle of Coke out of the soda machine outside the gas station downtown cost 15 cents. So for a quarter, you, you could get a delicious jelly-filled Bismarck and a bottle of Coke, which at the time sounded like just about the most perfect meal I could dream of. Or if you were returning from the barber shop with 50 cents and change, like I was one early summer Saturday morning, you could stop and buy six jelly-filled Bismarcks, one for every member of my family. 
Did I mention that I loved Jellyfield Bismarck's? We didn't realize it at the time, but we were living in a Norman Rockwell painting. We played basketball in our driveway, football and baseball in our backyards. We shot BB guns and played hide and seek and war in the small woods behind the houses on the other side of the street from us. In winter, we built snow farts and we built snow forts and played duck duck goose. On warm summer nights, kids from the entire neighborhood would be outside until well after dark, playing kick the can, our laughter echoing on the warm night breeze. We mowed lawns and shoveled snow. We walked to and home from school. We hunted for Sasquatches and ghosts and evidence of UFO landings. We watched black and white television, mostly westerns and war shows. We were, within the confines of our small town, isolated and shielded from the outside world, the world we saw on television news reports, the world of assassinations and riots and cities burning and body bags. None of that seemed real. None of that could reach into our little village. Then death came to town. I was eight years old and it was summer when a new family moved, in, moved into the house at the southern end of the other side of the street. They had two boys, Joey, who was my age, and his brother Jerry, two years younger. We just met when they came over to play with me in the sandbox my dad made for us. We played for hours under a beautiful blue summer sky, lost in the discovery of new friends and new neighbors. Then it was time for them to go home and something strange happened, something that, that to this day has never left me. We got to the edge of my front yard and Joey and Jerry, <clears throat> ages eight and six, stopped, held hands, and very slowly and formally looked both ways before crossing Yorkville Avenue to get to their side of the street. This struck me as very peculiar, as Yorkville Avenue was about as quiet a street as you'd find, especially during the midsummer weekdays when all the men were off to work. I don't recall who told me, but a few days later, I learned that not long before moving to Yorkville Avenue on the street where they used to live, their older sister had been killed hit by a car as she ran across the street. Now it made sense. The two brothers holding hands, looking up and down a quiet, empty street, small under the vast and enormous midday sky. Death was real to Joey and Jerry, and was suddenly real to me, personified by the empty presence, by the absence of the sister I had never seen or met. This was about the time I became so terrified of the concept of death that I tried to avoid saying or even thinking the words dead or dying. I was old enough to know that, everybody, that everyone dies, that death is inevitable. But now, besides the nightmarish horror stories my brother told me about dead women with rotting flesh existing and occasionally coming back to life in our shared closet, as real and frightening as those stories were, they were never as real as the empty space that stood beside the two small brothers holding hands in front of Yorkville Avenue. That empty space didn't give me nightmares, the way the stories my brother told me did, but it haunted my, wake, wake, my, my waking hours, resulting not so much in fear as in the overwhelming weight of sadness, the image of the boys represented for me even at that young age, the same sadness I feel when my memory conjures up the image now, more than 40 years later. <clears throat> now, at age 55, I'm old enough to know that the real world is never far away. I've lived through the death of three family members, including my mom and dad. Not a day goes by without me thinking about them. I still don't understand death, and I never will. It still terrifies me. One of the earliest dreams I had that I still remember came to me when I was about six years old. In my dream, for some reason, I was going to heaven. Heaven, it turns out, was a small, fluffy white cloud with an American flag sticking out of it. That was it. I remember waking up and being disappointed that that was all there was. I was too young to realize that it was just a dream, and that in reality, in my small hometown with my family all around me, with nothing to do all day but to run and play and imagine, and with eight cent jelly filled Bismarcks and 15 cent Cokes, I was already in heaven. All right, Dave Gordeaux, thank you very much. And next up is going to be Troy McDonald. Hello, Troy. Hello, how are you doing? Good, Troy, thank you very much. What are you going to be reading for us today? Well, um, you know, Walter, you said earlier that uh, you were amazed at Marguerite's ability to come from this terrible place. And obviously not every place is as, uh, you know, terrible as what she went through, but we all have that time in our life. And so I've been writing kind of this self-help book for the last year. I've been going to it and coming back. And it's kind of the book that I wish that I uh, wrote or read, you know, when I was in high school. So this is a, an, ex an excerpt from that. I remember being in high school wanting the very first iPhone 
And that changed the landscape of the mobile phone business. There was never a touchscreen phone before it. I didn't have many friends and was determined to have it. In some weird way, I thought if I could have the phone, that the empty void inside of me would be filled. Crazy, right? A cell phone? That is indeed what I thought. I even boycotted school until I got one. I eventually did, and it was amazing, but the luster wore off. I soon became unsatisfied and returned to the life of food and ditching school that I was used to. It wasn't until I discovered what I'm going to tell you in this book that I became Troy McDonald. We often get tied so much into the ego, and ego is a part of our brain that believes we are better or less than, smarter, taller, or whatever than others. It is the labels we attach to ourselves to feel better or worse about ourselves. And I felt so poorly about myself that I let things, food, phones, other people, control my life. It was a sad and desperate place to be. Let me tell you something. I was bullied in high school and told I would never amount to everything. I was so content with being homeless that I would go into the grocery stores to pick out a coffee can that would be used to collect change. I would say, that will be perfect on the street. Not too big, not too small. Pathetic as I look back. Have you been there? Defined by outer earthly things, your clothes, your car, your marriage, or lack thereof. Do you wish for more or less? Are you always looking towards the future instead of living in the now? That is what the reality of now is all about. Connecting to the center of yourself, your heart space, as I call it. Your heart space is the center, and the age-old question is how to get there. Now, what I'm about to tell you might sound so shockingly simple that you might close this book. And if you do, I feel sorry for you. Although it may sound simple, keeping this practice in action is something you have to work at every single day. In the following chapters, you'll be enlightened, possibly outraged at yourself or others, and hopefully inspired to make a change in your life. In order for this to truly work, you must believe two things about yourself. Number one, you are worthy. It doesn't matter how much you want to know the answer. If you don't believe you are worthy to hear it, then it won't work. Although I cannot hear you physically, I can imagine you are saying, well, of course I believe I'm worthy. I'm glad you have so much optimism. That is awesome. Let me throw this wrench in. If you were to lose everything you own, your job, titles, your children, your marriage, and everyone you love in this very moment, would you still feel you're worthy? Interesting question. By being alive, you are worthy. The titles don't make you who you are. They enhance who you are. They play a crucial role in how you identify yourself in the world, but they are not your world. We'll discuss that later on. This reminds me of the helicopter mom I saw recently on Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil featured a mother who did her kids homework so they wouldn't fail. On the show, the mother's 15-year-old son was begging her to do his own homework. Could you imagine your son or daughter begging you to do their own homework? The mother even flossed their teeth and cooked all of their meals. The mother was so afraid of losing her kids, she was running, excuse me, she was ruining them to keep herself sane. This mother had a classic case of feeling unworthy. She didn't know what or who she was without her kids and identified as a mother first and a human being second. She was so trapped in her own selfishness that her kids were suffering severe damage. The woman had to find out who she was, let go of all that that held her back, and most importantly, let her kids explore the world. I wrote this for mothers like her and for people like you, searching and seeking to live their ultimate truths. And fact number two, you deserve a better life. This book was written for people who want a better life, and it may sound like a silly question or a silly statement. Everyone says they want a better life, yet they do the same things that make them unhappy. Maybe it's working the same job for over 30 years and you want to escape. Maybe you want to marry your partner, but you're scared of what the future may be. Maybe you're stuck in a relationship and you need to get out. Whatever it is, this will give you the power to make those things happen. In fact, the lessons are so powerful, they work almost immediately. It's up to you if you're willing to take a risk and change your life. I interviewed Lindsay Frucci on my talk radio podcast, The Troy Show. Lindsay was a stay-at-home mom with no business experience. She loved brownies and decided to give it a go and make a healthier brownie made with yogurt instead of eggs. Everybody, and I mean everybody, including her husband, told her she would fail. She stuck to her guns and continued to make the best damn brownie she could. 
She tried hundreds of recipes. She invested her life savings and risked it all. She didn't even have good credit. She worked her way into Whole Foods and other grocery stores around the country. Her product, No Pudge Brownies, was even featured on Good Morning America. Lindsay sold the company for an undisclosed amount of money later on. Lindsay chronicles her story in her book, The Pig and Me. The pig was her brand logo. It was one of my favorite episodes, and it proves the theory true. Risks will come to you if you implement the teachings in this book. Be open and willing to live your ultimate life after reading this very book. You deserve a better life, and once you accept everything in this book, it will fall into place. Troy McDonald, thank you very much. You are listening to you. Speaking of Our Words. Okay, so one thing that makes us all unique as writers, I believe, is our voice. And voice can mean a whole number of different things. You know, we have our, our own voices. You know, I, I've heard work from all of you guys here in the studio. I've heard several pieces from a lot of you. And I'd like to think that if you were to give me your work without your name on it, just written, you know, and I didn't know it was from you, um, I would like to think that about halfway through the first page, I can probably guess that, oh, this is, I, I, I know whose piece this is. And even if, even if it's material that I know, I should still, I'd like to think that I can, you know, tell whose voice this is. And what I find so interesting about, especially all of your voices is they're all very engaging. So one of the things I want to talk about here is, you know, what is voice and how do we all get voice on the page, like our, our own voices, how do we get the voices of the story itself on the page, the voices of all the characters that are in there, you know, any sort of exaggeration, because that's the one fun thing about doing this show is that, you know, you're all reading aloud and, and, and we all, you know, inflect our own voices in these things. And there's a sense of exaggeration coming through sometimes and sometimes this sense of playfulness that, you know, like that was coming through in, in Troy's piece and, and the way of, you know, the, the way of words that Dave and Irene both have. And, and with all the pieces that we've heard from Marguerite, I, I, one of my colleagues at Columbia College Chicago, and I can't remember who, tried to define voice. And we all just had a laugh because we really can't, Define voice, but I'm going to ask all of you guys in a few minutes. You know, how how, how would you define voice? And I've I've heard one person sort of relate it to um, our own voices as as writers, as artists, as as creators and people. It's sort of like our own fingerprint, you know. And then you can just sort of like take it off from there. One of one of the games that we play in our uh, story workshops. Um, at Columbia College Chicago in the creative writing department is after we've heard it's it, it takes a few weeks to hear all the students voices in the class we try to get them all to where they hear at least some excerpt from either work they've turned in or some journal responses and usually by about week three week four you know we've heard at least one piece from all the students in the class so once once that happens um, one of the games that I like to play is after we hear a selection, you know, usually what happens is I will start reading um, from the piece and I usually turn it over to the student who wrote it to either finish reading the section of the piece. And sometimes if it's a longer piece, we'll pass it around amongst the class. But usually after I read about the first page or so, I will ask the class, so whose voice is this? Who do you think wrote this? And everyone's looking around at each other. And like I said, it's usually around week four and everyone's just scared to death of one another and of sharing the work and they're all afraid to answer. Um, sometimes it's quite clear because of the material. Oh, we know it's so-and-so that wrote this. And a lot of times we just have to think about it, you know, and then I usually get a few responses. And, and once I get a response is I will ask, well, why do you think it was that person's voice? And I'll ask them to point out exactly what was going on on the page for them to understand that, oh, that was so-and-so's piece. Um, and, you know, I call it a game, but, you know, I don't give out any prizes or anything like that. But a lot of times, when I was a student in these same workshops and guessing this game, I was the worst at it. I always guessed the wrong person every single time. Um, but then the question is, why do you think it's that person's voice? You know, that's where I was always right, because even if I guessed it was so-and-so's piece and I was wrong, I would say, well, it's because so-and-so, you know, does this on the page. I recognize that so-and-so can do this on the page. And that's where you actually really win the game because you are understanding what, you know, 
each person in the class is doing. And even if you don't guess whose piece it is, you know, still by saying this is what I know about this person and their writing, that's where you really come to an understanding. And after a 15-week semester and, and playing that game every day, it gets to be a lot of fun because everyone knows each other by then. They're more or less comfortable with, with sharing their work with the class. And, and they're a lot more comfortable with, with understanding what each person is really good at and what they can do on the page, you know. And that's just all by listening to their voice. One of the coachings we give when we're reading out loud is, you know, listen to your voice as you read it and listen to the voice of the story as you read it out loud. So there's something really to be said about reading, you know, your, your own work and other works out loud to hear that voice, to physically hear it in your ears, in your head, and, and, and then to figure out how, how in the world did you get that to the page? How do I get these things on the page? So um, with all that, I have no idea if that is an accurate definition of voice <laughs> at all or not. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to you guys. And, and Jim, I'm going to start with you because you're sitting right here next to me. And, uh, and I see you grimacing because I know this is a very loaded question. Um, but, but, but Jim, in, in your experience as a writer, not just with your own work, but with, you know, all these other works that you've read um, throughout the course of your, of, of your life here, how would you define voice? Well, let me start with this. <laughs> <laughs> voice is not what I speak with. <laughs> it's, it's how I, I think. And I, a few months ago, when I was still immature, <laughs> I, would, I would be kind of dogmatic in the way I would write and the, way I would, the tenor of it. And something happened, and I, I've slowed it down a little bit so that my voice, interestingly, actually as I speak and as I write, is slowed down. And I'd say it's got something to do with how I think. Mm -hmm. That's actually another coaching that we give in our workshops, especially when reading stories out loud, um, because only one person has the work in front of them. The rest of us are all listening. We don't all have copies of work, whether it's student work or published work. And when someone is reading too fast, one of the coachings we give as, as instructors and directors of the workshop is to slow down because there's this idea that you're right. I mean, you've got to slow down to how you're thinking, you know, and you can think a lot faster than you can read and you can think a lot faster than you can write. But to slow that all down in your mind and to, to listen to that and to get to the page. Yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty good. Um, Irene, how would how would you define voice? Well, I definitely agree that it's the thinking process that goes into any piece that you write. And when it feels right, I think you're projecting your beliefs, your um, philosophy, your truth about life and about people that you have either experienced or you know. And it's the way in the method that you project them and then when it makes good sense and it feels right, that I think is your voice. As I told you a little bit uh, before, just yesterday or the day before, I read a, a nonfiction piece to myself and I thought, this is darn good. <laughs> and it's one of the first pieces I ever read to the KWG and I told you that I really heard my voice because in it I could tell that those were the thoughts, those were the beliefs, those were the truths that I learned and that I experienced and that I wanted to project. And I think that was my voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Dave, Dave, how would you define voice? I think um, I would define it in a couple of ways. One, as a reader, I think it's the, um, a lot of things I've been talking about, is it's the essence of the, of the storyteller coming across. So you hear, you hear the rhythm, the cadence, and so on. As a writer, I think it's similar to um, musicians who, jazz musicians and, and blues musicians, a lot of times we say they have a soul. And I think your voice actually, to a range point, it's some of everything you are, it's your soul. And, and when you're writing, when you're really in a groove, it just takes you over there. It's like, it like writes for you, you know, and, and you don't know where some of the stuff came from. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I, I equate it to soul, actually. So I think it's something that you you can hone, you can, you can practice your craft and get better at it. I'm not sure you can actually teach it from the beginning, you know. I think there's something that you have to have there at the outset. So I come back to soul. 
I think this this sort of to sort of piggyback what Irene was saying. I mean, I I, I like all of the stuff so far. Um, I mean, we were talking about at, at at some point during the recording, we had, we had stopped to chat about a few things, and you were talking about these universal truths, which is what I was trying to say about um, what Marguerite was getting at when she was talking about my work. These universal truths that we all go through. Um, but I think in 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 finding material and and writing your stories, whether or not you know, you know, get, getting your beliefs and all this stuff onto the page is this idea of whatever um, this sort of idea of getting these universal truths on the page is this whatever you're writing, whether it's nonfiction or fiction or fantasy or science fiction, any of these things. Um, I think you're still getting at these various things on the page. It's, it's, it's your beliefs are coming through all this stuff. Walter, how would how how would you define voice? Uh, a couple things. First, first off, you're right. Your voice does change. It, it does grow as you grow and learn. Your voice also grows and learns. I read my first first story I ever wrote, and I was like, oh, whoa, 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 that's. I guess that is me. I wanted to rewrite it and redo it so it's the new me, but I thought I, I should leave it. I should leave that old me there so I could always go back and see what my voice was like at that time. So I, I left that story the way it is, and I sent it out, and it's getting published, yay. <laughs> and and that's what I did. And I, I, I think I'm going to do that with almost all my stories. I, I'm going to leave them where they're at. I mean, maybe a couple revisions, but my voice should still stay there and not move. Um, and the other thing about voices, you, you said you could recognize it. Like, if you read a King novel, you'll know it's a King novel. If you read, um, you know, uh, any any great novels you'll know uh, right away that's Poe or that's that's who they are and um, you're uh, Chris is judging a, a contest for Left of the Lake magazine and I I sent in a story and you're not supposed to send your name put your name on the paper so he's probably reading my story and he goes, that's Walter there I, just, <laughs> I know that one you know so yeah and and I've tried to change my voice I've tried to write different like okay let's try stream of consciousness or switch from first to third and back and and no matter how I change my writing, it's 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 still me in the story. I could still see myself in that story. So yeah, it's something that's really hard to do. You know, you're still trying to find the voice of the story. Lisa, how would how would you define voice? Well, for me, I think even just a little bit of the actual sort of taking it literally of you know your voice of sort of how you would speak or uh, you know how you are in everyday life. Um, I've been writing since I was a little girl, so I know my voice has definitely, definitely changed, you know, probably quite a bit over over the years and just as I write more and sort of refine, you know, refine the craft. <laughs> but um, one of the things too, you know, I mostly did fiction writing, you know, up until probably college age. Um, and then, you know, started doing some nonfiction. Of course, now I do a lot of nonfiction and try to do a little bit of creative writing when I have a chance. But um, I think I've found that, you know, even in the nonfiction that I do, there still is that voice that I would have in my creative writing. Um, one of the best examples of that, I think, is I had done a freelance article for um, a Milwaukee magazine, and the editor changed format at the last minute. And I wasn't aware of that until the magazine actually came out. And uh, one of my former coworkers and friends, you know, picked it up and was reading it. And she's like, oh, this, wow. She's like, you know she changed it so much that it doesn't even sound like you wrote it anymore. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a compliment and kind of a surprise for me because, you know, she's not a writer, um, you know, or any kind of, you know, really like, uh, you know, artist herself. But, um, you know, it, it meant a lot to me that she actually could perceive that, that, you know, the editor had changed it so drastically that it, you know, didn't even sound like something I might have might have mm -hmm. done. So I think, you know, like I said, that does almost literally come through where that voice is sort of uniquely you and, you know, how you might speak or how you interact with people. Yeah, yeah. And Troy, how, how would you define voice, Troy? You know, um, very good question. Uh, loaded, as you, <laughs> <laughs> as you said. You know, for me, it's funny that you say that you have a hard time doing um, or that you did uh, nonfiction, because for me, it's the exact opposite. I've never done any fiction in my life because for me voice is being authentic to me and when I'm speaking from my experiences I think that's the best story um, there is you know when it's coming from places that I've and experiences that I've been through um, but I also think about the emotional impact on the reader how can my voice and my experience change what the reader is going to make their day better 
make them cry, make them happy at different points, you know, in the story. So for me, and it's kind of like what, as you were saying too, uh, what a musician does is how do you get that emotional impact and something that people all over the world can get, um, you know, very simply and easily. So that's what I try to do with my voice is it's authentic to me, my personal experience. Um, and that's what I, I guard, you know, when I write, it's, is this how I feel at this moment? And I try not to change it a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I gave everyone here uh, about two seconds to think about how they would yeah. define voice, um, knowing that this was a loaded question. And there are uh, seven of us here, and, and all seven of us had a different yet fairly similar take on it. And, you know, if we had any more people here in the studio, we would get that many more definitions on it. Voice is just one of those things that you just really can't define, but you know it when you hear it, you know it when you see it. So this, if we had more time, I would love to discuss more about voice, um, but we're just about out of time here. So um, Lisa, president of the Kenosha Writers Guild, if someone is interested in joining the Kenosha Writers Guild, what do they need to do? Well, we uh, don't charge any dues or fees for our meetings or the special events that we host. So um, I just welcome anyone who's interested to come on down and join us at a meeting. Um, we meet every second and third Thursday at 6.30 in the Hedberg Library at Carthage College. And um, second Thursday meetings are special workshops, guest speakers, um, in-depth critique sessions, and panel discussions. We try to sort of alternate those every other month. And then um, the third Thursday is just our main meeting where you can come in and share some work if you'd like to and uh, provide feedback for the other members. Yeah, and all these meetings are free? Free, and uh, same thing with the special events, that we never charge any fee for that either. So Yeah, free and open to the public. So so please come to one of our meetings and check us out if you want to share your work. Or, you know, like I was saying before, how I'm always a little bit scared to read from my work every now and then. Um, if you're a little bit scared, but you still want to know what's going on and to, to meet some writers and, you know, get a little bit into their process, please, please come to one of our meetings and check us out on the Internet. So... Um, if you have any questions or comments or you wish to participate on this program, please visit KenoshaWritersGuild.com and come to one of our meetings. Please visit the Facebook and YouTube pages for this show, Speaking of Our Words, and feel free to leave a comment. Thanks to Dave Cole and WGTD, Steve Brown and Nita Hunter, our engineer Troy McDonald, Lisa Adamwitz kless and the Kenosha Writers Guild. Thank you very much to all of our guests today. Uh, Jim Payne, Irene Baylock, Dave Gordo, Walter Gascoigne, Lisa Adamowitz Kless, and Troy McDonald, and Marguerite McClellan. Thank you all for, for sharing our work and, and Marguerite's work today. Uh, this is Chris DeGuire, and the world needs your stories. We will see you again. Thank you for listening. The last one is called Now. This is the shortest. I'm only passing here. A thousand rippling rivulets converging in this place grace the flowing face of time. A knot unravels here before the choking of the chain. A breeze sings the leaves of silent trees into a fleeting form, flitting into oblivion immediately. I am not but passing here, tomorrow I'll be gone.